uh, SVT grand bicep. Sorry, yeah, for, sort of. For the first introduction, and we're going to hear today about quad results. Okay. Uh, thanks. <laughs> All right, that's great, that's excellent. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you about Quad. Uh, first of all, very brief motivation for this audience, it's probably mostly unnecessary, but uh, it is now true that the total intensity anisotropy of the CMV has been superbly well measured over a huge range of angular scales from multi-degree, you know, from the, the whole sky scales down here, all the way out to scales of a few arc minutes out here. Uh, you only really need to put up two experiments to show this whole range of scale, WMAP and ACBAR, uh, cover the, this whole range of scales. And it's just astonishing when you step back and think about it that this predicted series of acoustic peaks is really there, right? This is something the theorists predicted from theory, uh, and we went out and measured it, and we see exactly what they said we would see. Now that's very, it's, it's very unusual to see exactly what you're supposed to see, right? Usually some tweaks result when you actually measure it. So co modern cosmology, as we're all aware, is this kind of glorious but absurd science, right? So we have this model. It makes these predictions that are borne out in a whole range of ways, uh, not just the CMB, but a whole range of ways. But yet it's a completely incomplete model that has some very uncomfortable co consequences. We have to put in ad hoc made up components. And it, it, it dictates that the universe is not just expanding, but the expansion is accelerating and that the acceleration will continue indefinitely into the future and become a crushingly strong effect. Now, when I show this plot to, to, in public talks, I get embarrassed, right? Because what you're saying is that, look, here we've got these tiny deviations from a linear expansion, right? You know, we were decelerating, now we're accelerating slightly. But in the future, it's going to become this crushing, unmissable effect, right? And so it just doesn't seem very likely. So the, the, the all I'm really trying to say is that if, we have to check the paradigm of lambda CDM in every way we can. And CMB polarization is one of the ways in which we can make a paradigm check. We can make some new observations and see if they match the predictions. So we all know, you probably all know how, how CMB polarization is generated. It's generated because you have some electrons in the last scattering surface that are exposed to a quadrupole anisotropy of incoming radiation, radiation that differs over an angle of 90 degrees. The outcoming radiation then acquires a, a net linear polarization. Now, uh, the, the source of this quadrupolar anisotropy in the last scattering surface is the motion of the material. The material is moving, it's flowing from, from over-dense regions to under-dense regions and vice versa. And that means that in its local rest frame, it sees, a, uh, it sees a, a Doppler shift along the line of sight, along the direction of motion versus across the direction of motion. And that generates polarization uh, very directly. So if you have density perturbations, you will have motions of material and you will have, uh, uh, you will have polarization. This generates E mod polarization, right? Because the motion of the material is along the gradients in the, in the density, and that, that gives you an alignment pattern of the, of the, of the polarization, which, which we call E mods. It's uh, where, the, uh, where the polarization is directed along the direction of, uh, of, uh, of intensity change. So it will not give you B mods. So we, from the T, and uh, anisotropy, we have naturally E modes and TE cross correlation. Okay. Uh, given a T spectrum that you've measured and this lambda CDM model, you can predict what you should see for E and TE. And if you don't, it would be a huge deal. Right. So uh, just to show this on an experimentalist linear scale, normally this would be plotted on a log scale, just to emphasize that the polarization, the E mode polarization, is 1% in power units of, of T. So it was a long struggle to get enough experimental sensitivity to see the E mode polarization. I was part of the DAISY experiment, which was the first experiment to conclusively uh, show that the CMB is polarized. And we got a, a, you know, a five sigma result. This was not measuring multiple band powers. It was just saying, asking the question of the analysis, is the CMB polarized or not? Uh, we were consistent. We were consistent with there being E modes with the expected amplitudes and B modes with zero amplitude. And this is the Daisy experiment here, and some of the people who worked on it. Uh, we reused this platform for the experiment I'm going to tell you about today, Quad. So, uh, 18 months ago, uh, before the Quad data releases, and there's been a, a release from CatMap in the same time period, 
The evidence for peaks in this EE spectrum was still very, very sketchy. Here's the theoretical prediction. Here's the points. It's kind of like the T spectrum was, I don't know, getting on for 10 years ago now, where there was hints of peaks and troughs, but no definitive evidence. And the same thing with TE. There was pretty good measurements at low L from, uh, from WMAP, but then also a series of you know, sketchy evidence for a series of peaks. So uh, that's the, the basic polarization, right? The E modes uh, generated from the density perturbations. Uh, there are a series of, of loosely call them second order polarization effects. E modes get lensed into B modes by the intervening large scale structure as the uh, photons are coming to us from the last gathering surface. They get deflected slightly, and this breaks the purity of the E mode structure and gives you a small B mode. Gravity waves propagating through the primordial plasma, presumably coming from inflation, would also generate B mode, anisotropy, call these gravity wave B modes. And when the universe reionizes, you get additional scattering and additional generation of, of polarization anisotropy. So these, these three effects, these three second order effects, Here's the E mode spectrum. It gets lensed into B modes, and basically you just see a smooth version of the E mode spectrum. So this is an effect that's dominant at higher L's. The gravity wave B modes, should they exist, should be concentrated around L of 100. And then these reionization effects are on the very largest angular scales, the, uh, the lowest multipoles, so scales <coughs> comparable to the whole sky. And so uh, why would we make further polarization measurements? Well, at L of greater than 150, where quad is, as I already emphasized, it's all about checking the paradigm. Right? If you can get enough sensitivity to see lensing B, then you can get some further information. The level of lensing B is not deterministically predicted. The E modes are almost deterministically predicted, but the B modes are not. There would be some information on neutrino mass and dark energy when we can measure that. Uh, in this L range around 100, you can go after detecting the gravity wave B modes, because that's where they're the most distinct from the E modes. Uh, from the uh, lensing B modes. And at L's less than 30, uh, again, you can, you can, these measurements of E and TE constrain reionization. We have that already from WMAP. And you can also try and detect gravity wave B modes down there. So uh, at these higher L's, where quad is at, is measuring polarization any help to parameters? Well, unless you can get down to the lensing B modes, the answer is basically no. This is a, a result from a paper that people in this room probably worked on. It was the boomerang uh, uh, polar, uh, parameter constraint paper. And we go from green to blue, adding their E and TE information. And you can see that the green and the blue error bars on these parameters are the same in almost in every case. So you don't get much for parameters. If that's really what you're interested in, you should probably spend your time measuring the, the, uh, the temperature spectrum to finer and finer detail. So what is quad? Quad uh, is a merger of a, of a collaboration called Quest, which was building a receiver uh, and having some trouble getting, uh, 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 getting a telescope and getting money to deploy on that telescope. Around that time in 2003, DAISY was starting on its final season of polarization observations, and they approached us uh, with a view to putting their receiver onto the DAISY platform uh, to form a new experiment. And we did this. And so we called it QUAD, and that's the contraction of Quest and DAISY. So it's an acronym of acronyms. <laughs> so this is the QUAD collaboration. Uh, Sarah Church is overall US PI at Stanford. Walter Gear at Cardiff in the UK is, is, the, is the European PI. Uh, a large number of people are here. I'm not going to go through them, but I will mention this guy. This guy, Robert Schwartz, is shown standing on a ladder here inside the bowl-shaped ground screen of the quad telescope, which is here. This whole thing is standing on top of a tower about 30 feet above the snow surface at the South Pole. You can see the polar plateau in the background here. This guy, Robert Schwartz, deserves special mention. He wintered over with the telescope for three winters running. Right? He's a German guy. Uh, he seems uh, a little bit of a live wire when you meet him. But the important thing about him is that he doesn't get any crazier through the winter. Right? <laughs> most individuals do. They either become depressive. Well, they mostly become depressive, actually. So our experiments operate at the South Pole, right? You can only go to the South Pole for three months a year when the planes can fly in and out. The rest of the time, it's too cold. And of course, it's dark for six months continuously, right? There's one day and one night per year. The base is open during the three months we go there to install equipment, but usually none of the science team is crazy enough to want to stay through the winter to look after the telescope. So therefore, every year we have to find one individual who's prepared to do so. And you can, you can, if you put an advert out there saying, you know, winter other scientists required must spend six months at South Pole, actually it's more like eight by the time you, you, uh, you get in and get out, 
Uh, you get replies, but most of these people are crazy and you don't want them. Uh, the people who are well qualified don't want to do it. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's absolutely golden when you find a guy like this who's both competent, wants to do it, and stays competent through the whole winter. Because a lot of people get, no, I'm serious, about, you know, about four months in, five months in, they stop replying to emails so responsibly. They're just obviously depressed and having a hard time taking it. You know. But this guy stays the same. He did three winters in a row. That doesn't mean he was there for three years, continuously comes out during the summer for a couple of months, a couple of months vacation and then back again. And uh, he, wanted, he wanted to do it again, you know. He still wants to do it again. He's applying to be an astronaut right now. Anyway, he's a hero. Without him, none of this that I'm going to tell you about would be possible. And that is my hand sticking out of the front of the telescope. This white thing holds up the secondary mirror. I'll come back to that in a second. So what we did was we recycled the DAISY platform, the, the machine, the mechanical steel machine that moves and points. Uh, it has a third axis, so it's an azimuth elevation mount, and it can also rotate the entire telescope around the line of sight. We have a 31 pixel polarization sensitive bolometer camera on now, come back to that in a second. The secondary mirror is supported on this white thing, this cone made of foam. The foam is transparent to microwaves, right? So in principle, the secondary mirror is supposed to float in front of the primary. Uh, we reuse the tower, the ground screen, the equipment room, the drive system. Uh, uh, in fact, we extended the ground screen. So we reused many parts of the DAISY infrastructure. But it's basically, it's an all new telescope. So there's a, a primary mirror, uh, a secondary mirror. The radiation comes in, bounces off the secondary, down into the receiver cryostat. These lenses are within, the, inside the receiver cryostat and then down onto the focal plane. The uh, foam cone is something that I'm very proud of because I, I built it. I ended up having to build it. Uh, uh, it's, it. It's made of a very special foam which is almost completely transparent to microwaves at these frequencies, but it's only made in six foot by three foot flat sheets. So we had to somehow form these flat sheets into sections of a cone and then stick them together to make a cone to support the secondary mirror. So we built a uh, four foot by eight foot by eight foot plywood box, insulated it, and installed 30 kilowatts of electric heat in it. Uh, it turns out the University of Chicago does have a safety department, and they came to see it. Uh, they heard about it. I thought they were going to shut us down, but they didn't. Uh, they were actually worried that the fiberglass insulation inside might get out and get into people's lungs. They didn't seem to be concerned about a fire risk at all. <laughs> anyway, why did we build this? Right? So this foam, if you heat it up whilst holding it in a particular shape, then when you cool it back down again, it will keep that shape. You can thermoform it. Right? So this was a thermoforming oven. We made an elaborate mold, a wing-shaped mold in there to mold the foam. And then once we had these sections, we had to trim them and form them up. And so we made, a, we had made for us a 10 foot base diameter wooden cone, which is still sitting around in the high bay at Chicago as a very elaborate uh, piece of art, really. I mean, that's all it's good for now. So we built the cone on that, and the cone held up very well during three, three winters of observation. This now is the guts of the receiver. So down inside of the receiver, the, the front end of the receiver is at 250 millikelvin, a quarter of a kelvin above absolute zero. This is the focal plane. These gold uh, 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 cones here are, are feed horns, piping the microwaves down into the detector assemblies, which are hidden inside of this gold cylinder here. Uh, we have 12 of those feed horns at 100 gigahertz, giving six arc minute beams on the sky, and 19 at 150 gigahertz, giving four arc minute beams. So here are the radiate. Here's the radiate, and the microwaves coming down into the focal plane. They go down the feed horn, and at the back of the feed horn, there are two orthogonal grids. These absorb the microwaves in the two linear polarization states. And so if you take the sum of the readout of these two, you're measuring total intensity. And if you take the difference, you're measuring polarization. So it's an extremely simple system. Uh, uh, you directly measure polarization as the difference of the two linear polarization states. So this thing is at the South Pole. The South Pole is here. The Antarctic continent is huge, right? We fly into McMurdo from New Zealand on military aircraft and then again on another kind of military aircraft from McMurdo into the South Pole. Uh, it's an enormous continent, completely covered in ice. Uh, when you're at the South Pole, you're standing on two miles thick of ice, about, about 9,000 feet of ice. And so here's me standing at the actual South Pole. Each year, the South Pole shifts because the whole thing is a glacier, right? It's flowing. It's a flowing ice sheet that's flowing to the sea. It flows about 30, 30 feet a year. And so every year, the South Pole is relocated. 
They send guys down from the US Geological Survey to do this. Now it's a complete boondoggle, right? They used to come down with theodolites and take detailed measurements of the sun. It took them several days to locate it with high accuracy. Now they come down with a GPS receiver, they step outside, <laughs> it's here, they plant the thing, and then they go home. So uh, <laughs> here it is. Here's this, where the South Pole was that year. Uh, the important thing to appreciate about the South Pole is that it's, there's nothing there, right? It's a completely featureless ice plain for 300 miles in every direction. The nearest piece of rock sticking out of the snow is 300 miles away. It's a completely alien environment. The, uh, the base is all there is. If you walk out away from the base, you, you, it's like you're on an alien planet. How far away is Dome C? Oh, probably 700 miles or something. A long way. So why do we do this at the South Pole? Why do we go to the South Pole? Because the atmosphere is so cold, it's also extraordinarily dry. The coldness is secondary. The thing that really benefits us is the dryness of the atmosphere. All of the, uh, all of the water vapor has been driven out of it by the cold, and what's left is in the form of ice, not water. So the atmosphere is nearly transparent to microwaves. It's also extraordinarily stable. We have one day-night cycle per year. After the sun sets, the atmosphere settles down, and it's extremely stable for six months. The fact that we have this, this six-month cycle and this, the fact that you can't go there during the winter enforces a lot of discipline on us. We have to go in during the summer, install equipment, upgrade equipment. Everything has to be working perfectly by the time we leave. Like I said, there's one guy who stays to look after it, but there's a limit to what he can do. Uh, and so we observe during the winter, uh, all the way through the winter, uninterrupted. Our fields, if you pick a particular point on the sky at the pole, it's just going round and round, right? You're, you're on the Earth's axis, so a point on the celestial sphere just goes round and round, a constant elevation angle above the ground. And that's important because the ground is a powerful emitter of radiation, and you would like, you would like the ground's contribution to what you're seeing to be as constant as possible, as low as possible and as constant as possible. Last but not least, there is a huge amount of an existing infrastructure and logistics. It's really easy to get stuff to the South Pole. I just ship it to a location in California, and it comes out of a well-established supply pipeline very efficiently a few weeks later at the South Pole. There's food, there's power, you know, there's a place to sleep. A lot of stuff is taken care of that we would otherwise have to look after for ourselves if we operated in Chile, for instance. So how does quad work, right? So the radiation comes in through the mirrors, down into the focal plane, onto the bolometers. So the physical temperature of the bolometer grid is actually reflecting the intensity of the incoming radiation from a little pencil beam patch of sky. We then take the entire telescope and scan it around. We move it backwards and forwards uh, in azimuth. And what we're doing is we're sweeping that set of pencil beams around on the sky. We read out the changing bolometer temperature. That's a function of pointing position. Right? We call that time order data, time stream data. Uh, and so we're directly measuring temperature differences on the sky as we scan the instrument. But any change in the bolometer temperatures will also appear as an indistinguishable change in the readout, right? So you need to keep the temperature, the physical temperature of the bolometers, extraordinarily stable. You need an outrageously stable system. So here are the, those pencil beams projected back onto the sky. This is declination, right ascension, a couple of degrees in each. And so we have these 12 100 gigahertz feeds and 19 150 gigahertz feeds uh, as the smaller circles here. The polarization grids are oriented as shown, the, the two linear uh, polarizations. And so we have two flavors of, uh, of uh, a polarization pixel. And we can also rotate the entire array, remember, around the line of sight. Okay. What is this one set which has only one pole? Oh, there's a dead one. The, one, of the, one of the grids is, doesn't read out properly in that pattern. So before you can, so we read out the two grids separately, right? So before you can take the difference, you have to normalize the gains to be equal to very good accuracy. So how do we do that? We take the, tele, the telescope and we move it in elevation up and down by about a degree. So here's, the, here's this time. This is elevation angle going up and down. And the bolometers uh, reflect going up and down in elevation. We're looking through uh, the slab atmosphere. And the atmosphere is highly transparent, but not completely, right? It's like one a few percent opaque. And so as you move up and down in elevation, you're looking through a different air mass. You, uh, you see a different uh, amount of radiation from the atmosphere. And so that's what's causing the, the bolometers to track the elevation angle. And so then we just measure the slope of each of these effectively, and we normalize them all to have the same gain. And then we can take pair differences to measure polarization. So how stable are those relative gains of the two halves? Obviously, we can only do that calibration. We do it about every half hour, this elevation nod move. And if the gains were shifting on time scales shorter than that, then we would, we would end up with leakage from temperature, from total intensity into polarization. So you need very high stability of those gains. 
Here they are shown. These are half-hour measurements over an entire season of data, and they're stable with an RMS of less than 1%. Now, in as much as they fluctuate, so long as it's a true random fluctuation, then sometimes you're, linking, you're leaking T into plus Q, and sometimes T into minus Q, uh, where, where Q is polarization. So, uh, in fact, the fluctuations will average down. It would only be systematic errors that would really hurt you. So, how do we observe? So, we're, we're moving the telescope backwards and forwards in azimuth by 7.5 degrees whilst tracking the sky. Okay, we scan five times out and back, then we step a little bit in elevation and we do the same thing again. So we're building a simple raster map of the sky. It's a completely non-cross-linked map, right? It's, it's uh, like a TV screen, uh, an old-style uh, uh, cathode ray tube TV screen scan pattern. Uh, we do run, one run per day, starting always at the same LST. So we, we observe in the directions on the ground, looking away from the lab building. There's a lab building attached to the telescope tower. We calibrate, we do eight hours of CMB observations, calibrate, we rotate the entire telescope, calibrate again, and another eight hours of CMB. The other, the other part of the day is taken up cycling the fridge to maintain that quarter Kelvin temperature on the focal plane. So here is the quad field, shown as this double white box here. It's uh, relatively near to the galactic plane. This, this color map here is, is a prediction of dust intensity. The reason that we, we chose this field is because it intersects with the boomerang uh, deep field here. And the reason in turn that they chose this field was because it was at a big angle from the sun in January at McMurdo when they flew their, their, their balloon. So uh, that's where we are. It's a low, very low foreground emission region, but the, possibly not the lowest. But it's good enough, as we'll see. So now to go from time stream data to maps. Uh, now that this is time, the telescope is moving backwards and forwards in azimuth whilst tracking the sky. So there's a slow trend on this triangle wave uh, modulation here. And we're seeing just the raw readout from all of the channels. The 150 gigahertz channels are in the greens and blues, and the 100 gigahertz channels in red. And so you're seeing, what you're seeing here is vastly larger than the CMB signal we're looking for, and it's atmospheric wonder. Basically, the atmosphere is not completely homogeneous. It's lumpy, particularly the water vapor in it, which is why the 150 gigahertz channels vary more. And we're just seeing lumps in the sky. Just think of clouds, right? It's, it's almost as if we're scanning backwards and forwards on, on some lumpy cloud pattern whilst the clouds are blowing by. Right? This is still in volts, but I think on the next plot, it gives you a, a translation to Kelvin, right? So... 0.05 here is about 10 millikelvin. This is huge compared to the CMB. Right? And so uh, what we then do is we take, we go from the raw data, we take the pair differences after we've normalized the gains. And this is the pair difference now. This is the signal that's going to give us polarization. And you can see that the atmospheric signal is almost completely common mode, right? The atmosphere is very unpolarized. So once you take the pair difference, uh, uh, a lot of this large scale uh, atmospheric signal goes away, large angular scale atmospheric signal goes away. So then we cut it up into half scans, which are just the constant velocity sections of each scan. We only use those. We don't use the turnarounds. And then we take a third order poly, we just subtract a best fitting third order polynomial from each half scan. We do that to get rid of a large amount of the residual atmospheric noise. This is throwing away information at, 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 at L's less than 200, so we don't really care because we don't end up measuring those anyway. So. Uh, then, you just, then we just take this time stream data and we bin it according to its pointing direction into a rectangular grid of pixels. We make the crudest possible map. Uh, and here are those maps integrated over a whole season of data. Uh, uh, actually, this is two seasons worth of data. So this is the 100 gigahertz map. This is an hour in right ascension versus, uh, let's see, 8 degrees here and uh, uh, 10 degrees here in, uh, uh, in declination. And, uh, sorry, not 10. I'm not saying eight, hey, yeah. So this is the 100 gigahertz total intensity map and the 150 gigahertz map. You can see that the 150 gigahertz map has a lot of artifacts in it. Uh, this is in part residual uh, atmospheric uh, noise, and it's mostly ground pickup, as we'll see in a moment. Okay. So that's th those are the temperature maps. Now to make polarization maps, which we make, we make Q and U maps. These are the components of the polarization pseudo vector, right? And so to go from the pair difference time stream to the Q and U maps, you need to know the orientation of your detector pairs for, as projected on the sky. So uh, we've confirmed that these are very close to the design values using an external source outside of the telescope whose polarization direction we know. Unfortunately, there are no astronomical sources with well-known polarization direction at these frequencies that are bright enough. 
So uh, to confirm that we, that we really are getting things right, that we're really reconstructing polarization with the right, uh, right orientation, we map the moon. Because this does have a known polarization pattern. It's radial. The polarization uh, pseudo-vectors are oriented radially due to scattering as the radiation exits the lunar surface. And so you can see here that, radi that radial pattern uh, uh, nicely reproduced. So now we can make polarization maps. And when we make full field polarization maps, they look terrible, right? It's full of some very obvious uh, uh, systematic effect. This is not the, the, the sky as it truly is. And what is that? It's ground pickup. So uh, although you know, we try to design the telescope so it's not sensitive to radiation from the ground, it's got this big shield around it, it's still not effective enough. The signal that we're after is so tiny that even a tiny pickup from the ground is enough to swamp the uh, cosmological signal. So fortunately, we did our observations in a lead trail manner. It's a, a method that's frequently used to, to get rid of ground pickup. So we scan for half an hour, we scan four rows on the lead field, by which time the, the sky is moved by half an hour in right ascension. So we then scan the trail field uh, uh, half an hour behind in right ascension for the next half hour. And what we're doing, therefore, is we're rescanning the same pattern in azimuth and elevation coordinates. In ground fixed coordinates, we rescan the same pattern. So when we take the difference of the lead field and trail field data, we get a difference map of the sky, and we cancel away any uh, uh, ground signal which is constant over half an hour. And this works remarkably well. Here's the 150 gigahertz U map. You go to the field difference map. Obviously, you've got half the area of sky, and all of this uh, 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 ground contamination goes away. Right? And what you're left with here, you can maybe see, I don't know, it depends on the projector, but you can see some kind of blobbiness, and that is real... Uh, cosmological polarization structure. I'll convince you of that in a moment. So, uh, so now we've got these polarization maps and we want to check, all right, so is that residual structure we're seeing there, is that really coming from the sky or is it some other, something else we still don't understand? So we do jackknives. It's integral to this kind of CMB studies. You always have to do jackknife tests. What they are is they're an internal consistency check you split the data into two halves, which should contain approximately the same, uh, 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 which should contain the same sky signal, but are likely to contain different false signal. And the most powerful one is probably the deck jackknife. Uh, we call this the deck. We refer to the rotating, the line of sight rotating part of the telescope as the deck. Uh, we actually observe for eight hours, then we rotate the platform, and we observe for another eight hours, pointing in a completely different direction over the ground. So. This piece of ground over here versus this piece of ground over here. So we're looking at different ground, so it's highly unlikely that the ground signal is the same. Plus, we've rotated the telescope by 60 degrees. The analysis knows about that from the point of view of the sky, but it's unlikely that the ground signal, that any spurious signal would rotate in the same way. So it's very unlikely that, these, that this jackknife would pass, that when you subtract these two data subsets, you would be left with zero. Uh, if the signal was spurious. So it's a very good test that the signal is really coming from the sky. We can also do a scan jackknife, forward versus backward scans, a season jackknife, the first half and second half of the data in time, uh, a focal plane jackknife where you take two different subgroups of, blo of uh, bolometer pairs and make maps with those two. And so after you've subtracted the maps, the results should just be noise. Okay, so here is the field difference 150 gigahertz U map that I just showed you. And when we apply the DAC jackknife, you can see that this blobbiness goes away and we're left with something that looks entirely like white noise. Okay? So now we want to test that uh, 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 more formally in power spectrum space. So we go from maps to power spectra. So I'm going to explain how we do that. Uh, this is a very simplistic analysis and I like it for that reason. Uh, uh, I'm a simpleton and I'm going to explain to you how simple it can be uh, and still be adequate for the level of sensitivity that we have with this experiment. So you have these two maps, Q and U, right, that describe the polarization pseudo-vector. Then we apodize them. Obviously, around the edge, they're poorly measured. We don't have much integration time there. So you divide that out. You divide down by the variance map to take out the edges. You apodize away the edges. You have to do this because we're about to do a Fourier transform. So you take these, and then you Fourier transform them and square the results. So this is the square of the Fourier transform of the Q map and of the U map. The reason there's a dark bar along the y-axis is because we did those, that polyfiltering along the half scan. So we've killed off large angular scale modes that are along the scan direction. And so that, that's, that's why you see this dark bar here. The remaining blobbiness is, 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 uh, is Gaussian random noise, as seen in the Fourier domain. 
So now uh, we've got Q and U. We can go to E and B in the Fourier domain extremely simply. A very simple relationship between Q and U and E and B. E and B being the basis uh, uh, which we're interested in cosmologically because it's, the prediction is that there are E modes and not B modes. So you can see that. Whereas Q and U are rather uniformly distributed. There's a pretty much a similar amount of power in Q and U. Once you go into the Fourier domain, it's all E and very little B. Okay? So now all the power spectrum is is the the mean of the square of these Fourier modes in annuli. So you just take the, 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 the mean value around one of these annuli, and that is your power spectrum. That is your raw power spectrum. So here it's shown for TT, EE, TE, and BB. Multipole number, uh, basically annulus going out in radius. Uh, and then the blue dots are the observed power. Now, I plotted here lambda CDM. We don't expect to agree with lambda CDM yet because we need to take care of noise and, and the filtering, which we've inflicted on the map by observing it with the telescope uh, and also in the data processing. So we do this using a simulation-based analysis, right? The noise is very complex. It's highly correlated between channels, uh, and it's strongly non-white. Certainly in temperature, it's, it's very non-white. The filtering of the sky is complex. We've only filtered along, uh, we've done this poly subtraction along the scan direction. We have no DC sensitivity in this experiment. It's all about uh, temperature differences. And so we derive corrections uh, empirically uh, using simulations. So we need to generate full time stream level realizations of signal and noise and process them identically to the real data. So for noise simulations, here are the time stream power spectra of the real data, pair sum and pair difference, as a function of a temporal frequency. 0.1 hertz to, to 1 hertz corresponds to L of 200 to 2000. So this is the band that we're really interested in for science. You can see the strong 1 upon F noise in the pair sum. Uh, it's pretty flat in the pair difference, uh, uh, as we expect. The atmosphere is unpolarized. And this is the regenerated. So this is the simulated. This is re-simulated noise. So we take this, we analyze it in a complicated manner and regenerate. And then we take the power spectrum of, of the regenerated noise, and we get this. You can see that these narrow line features have become boxcar features due to binning in the, in, the, in, the, in the process, but it's way above the science band, so we don't care about that. Within the science band, we reproduce very, very well the observed noise in the real data. Uh, so then you make maps of that. So this, these are maps of the noise component, uh, simulated maps of the noise component in temperature and polarization. Then you need to do signal-only simulations. So you take uh, input maps from, heel, from uh, the SINFAST generator in HeelPix, convolve those with the beam, and then we resample from them simulated time stream, inflict the same uh, filtering on it that we do in the, in the real, in it for the real data, and make maps of that. And uh, so now I'm showing for the EE spectrum only uh, versus multipole number, we're seeing the mean of the signal simulations, which is the suppressed version of lambda CDM, the mean of the noise-only simulations, which is just this L squared rising uh, uh, contribution, the, the observed points of the black points, and the welter of magenta uh, of cyan curves here are the signal plus noise realizations. There's a whole bunch of them, right? There's a couple of hundred here. And so the fundamental result of the experiment is, since the input model to the signal plus noise simulations was lambda CDM. The fundamental result is: Do the black points lie within the the, the magenta? Uh, sorry, the cyan range. Okay, but we would like to cor actually correct the spectra just to make them uh, uh, more amenable to uh, you know publication and al analysis by others. So to do that, we need to correct for the filtering. Uh, so we show I'm showing here the mean of the signal only simulations versus lambda CDM input model and its expectation values for each band power, these little red crosses, that more or less lie on the curve, but not exactly, because when we have a finite field size, so we, we smooth the, the input spectrum uh, with band power window functions. That's a detail you, you don't really need to worry about. Basically, what I'm doing is I'm taking the ratio of the red points to the magenta curve and plotting that here. This is what I call the filter beam suppression factor, right? It's the a fraction of power which survives the filtering by the beam and the polynomial subtraction. Polynomial subtraction suppressing it down here at the low L's, beam uh, convolution suppressing it at the high L's. So you have to divide that out. So we start with the raw spectra that I showed you a few moments ago. We subtract out the noise. We subtract out the mean of the noise-only simulations. You can see the B modes go from, from rising as L squared to being flat. The E modes also come down. The noise on the, uh, the impact of the noise on the T spectrum is very small, right? it's small compared to the T spectrum. Now I divide out that filter beam suppression factor 
and that jacks the spectra back up effectively, uh, corrects them for the suppression that they suffered, and uh, so this is the result now. So the points are now sitting uh, in agreement with lambda CDM. So uh, we estimate the error bars on the points using the signal plus noise simulations. So basically, you just you correct the signal plus noise simulations also for noise and uh, uh, and filtering. And then you're left with this uh, welter of curves. You just take the, the spread of the curves at each band power and you call out the error bar on the experimental result. That will obviously only be correct if the cosmology you've, you've assumed in the sims is close to reality. Fortunately, it is. Well, fortunately, unfortunately, I wish it wasn't, actually. It would be more exciting. But, uh, so here are the 150 gigahertz corrected spectra after that, that process is done. So you can see uh, we have uh, the blue points of the signal spectra the black points are the deck jackknife spectra. So the, 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 the jackknife spectra should be consistent with zero. Right? So you can see that visually by eye they, they appear to be. Uh, we'll come to actual chi-squared tests in a moment. And the signal spectra appear to be consistent with lambda CDM. And they have very high signal to noise. Look at the, uh, uh, look at the ratio between this error bar size here and how high these EE points are. There's a huge signal to noise uh, in, the, in this data. So now we do jackknife tests, right? So, so far I've been concentrating on 150 gigahertz TT through BB. We can also make uh, uh, TB and EB spectra, and so we do. We can also make spectra at 100 gigahertz, and we can make frequency cross spectra between the 100 and 150 gigahertz channels, and there are alternate cross spectra. So you end up with a, a, a large number of spectra you can take the chi-squared of each one for each jackknife test uh, uh, and convert it to a probability to exceed, a probability to get a chi-squared greater than that by random chance if, the noise is if, there is, if, if it's really just Gaussian noise. And those PTE values, a probability to exceed values, should have a flat distribution, a uniform distribution between 0 and 1. And here's a histogram of those uh, chi-squared tests. And you can see it uh, appears to it looks pretty flat, right? Uh, within the statistics, this is consistent with a flat distribution. So, uh, do we have any evidence? So, uh, uh, do we have any evidence for foregrounds? Right. So, what I've shown you so far wouldn't mean that there wasn't foreground. It just means that, that the sky signal cancels away. There's no evidence for instrumental systematics, experimental systematics. But it, but some of this pattern that we're seeing could still be non-CMB signal, right? So is that the case? So we have a 100 gigahertz map and a 150 gigahertz map, as I showed you earlier. And if we difference those, we get this. Right? So what can you see in this? Well, you can see some point sources. You can see a few point sources which have a spectral index, which is obviously different than the bulk of the signal we're looking at. And you can see some artifacts which come from the fact that the 100 gigahertz maps and the 150 gigahertz maps don't cover exactly the same patch of sky. And we've done this filtering. So they, it distorts the CMB pattern slightly and it introduces the, these sorts of artifacts. The simulations also suffer from those, and so we can quantify how much we expect to see uh, cancellation failure. And then uh, uh, we can take the, we can make the frequency difference spectra. So when we take these frequency difference maps, when we take those spectra, this is what we get. So TT cancels uh, very, very well. Uh, with huge signal to noise, uh, uh, we see nothing. I'm not quite sure how to say. We see what we see in TT is almost consistent with zero and is a cancellation uh, to at the few percent level. In EE uh, and the other spectra, we see no evidence for anything which isn't CMB, right? So uh, all this is basically saying is that the sky pattern is identical at the two frequencies to within the precision of the measurements. Okay, so we do not see foregrounds yet. And that's really cool. A few years back, people were writing papers saying that such measurements would be impossible without uh, doing multi-frequency projection of foregrounds. But at least at the sensitivity level at which quad is at, we do not encounter foregrounds yet. This is the on these plots. These are post um, finite field collections. So they, they actually deconvolve all these elements that are anti-correlated, I presume, in this plot. These are not, we do not decorrelate the, uh, uh, the band powers, and they are approximately 20% correlated. Wouldn't they be anti-correlated? Because the finite field of view causes a, a convolution. In it the depends how you do the analysis. In this analysis, they're not. They're positively correlated at the 20% level. It depends how you do it. The, uh, 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 we can talk about it later. The mode decoupling matrix is not applied in this analysis, and that is what generates the anti-correlation. So, OK. Sorry. Uh, I'm just looking at the EE okay. program. 
You're trying, trying to see a foreground in here. Well, <laughs> it's you, nice. you, you can if you want. I think, uh, let's see, do I have the chi squares here? No, just if you look at our paper, the chi squares are there and it's consistent with zero. Under a simple chi squared test, at least, it is. Okay, so let's look at those final results. So we can combine the 100, 150 in frequency cross spectra into single <coughs> sets of band powers. We do that for convenience and for publication. Uh, they're actually only slightly better than the 150 alone. The 150 is where most of our sensitivity is. And so uh, these are our final results, right? And they're nice. How do they compare to uh, previous experiments? Well, first of all, let's ask if they're consistent with Lambda CDM. Formally. So one way in which you can do that is to take that chi-squared versus the lambda CDM expectation values. What I'm plotting here is simply the difference between the black points and the red line divided by the error bar, okay? the fractional deviation of the band power values from lambda CDM. That's the blue points here. So this is sigmas, right? These, these are the sigmas of fluctuation from lambda CDM, where lambda CDM is, is zero in these units. And so then I take the chi-squareds of these ensembles of points, for EE, it's 20 for 23 points, which has a probability to exceed that by a chance of 64%. Right? So the chi-squared numbers are consistent with lambda CDM. One can, can start looking at this more closely and say, oh, look, most of the TEs are positive. Right? And so one can construct other statistics. Uh, for this analysis, we have chosen not to do so. You are, of course, at liberty to do so. Uh, and so we focused on the chi-squareds. When you're doing this kind of analysis, right? Initially, these tests don't pass, right? You have to work very hard at the analysis, work at getting rid of systematic contamination in the data before these tests pass. And so you have to decide ahead of time what your criterion is going to be for saying when you're done. Otherwise, you'll go completely insane and spend the rest of your life on it, right? So uh, the, the criteria that we determined was that this distribution of PTE values should be consistent with flat, right? And once it was, then we went ahead and published. Uh, one can, can cut other statistics, but then you have to worry. You know, you, you, you might say, oh, I'm going to look at this. I'm just going to add up the points and see if that's consistent with, with simulations. But you've already made a pre-human judgment here because you've already said, oh, look, most of these points are positive. Right? So the test that you're selecting is already based on, uh, there's been a trials factor that's very hard to quantify. Right? So unless you decide what your statistics are up front, you're going to get into terrible trouble. So we, we settled on chi-squareds, and these are these chi-squares are consistent with lambda CDM. If you try testing the points versus the null model, which is really a bit of an unfair test because under the null model, the error bars would be far smaller, uh, we have more than 10 EE band powers that are greater than more four sigma. So this is really a, a paradigm shift in, in precision of these kinds of measurements. The debate as to whether the CMB is polarized is firmly over, right? <laughs> uh, the probability of uh, 10 to the minus 33 that it's not, po uh, not polarized. So... Uh, one thing that's interesting maybe to some specialists here is, is what is the contribution of the various forms of uncertainty to these band power un final band power uncertainties. So uh, here, are, here is the total, uncert total random uncertainty. This is the sample variance contribution to it in dot dash. And so our EE band powers are sample variance dominated out to L of 1,000. Right? So in principle, we integrated far too long on far too small a patch of sky. We should have done more sky. I'm not sorry because it throws uh, systematic problems into starker relief if you integrate longer on a small patch. That's why we did it. Uh, but it is interesting that we're firmly sample variance limited in EE. So here's TT compared to other experiments. In the current data release that's out there, we do not improve over ACBAR, even at the highest L that we published to. We're comparable out of L of 2000. I'll show you something in a moment that goes beyond this, or uh, at least in simulation. Here is TE, so our points at higher L numbers are clearly, the black points here are quad, they're clearly far better than any previous experiment, and in fact better than the sum of all previous experiments at the higher Ls. And we see many positive and negative excursions of TE, just like Lambda CDM says we should. Uh, the EE points shown here on a log scale, showing only those published band powers which are above a two sigma detection, at more than two error bars from zero. Uh, we see a series of peaks. I would claim that Quad sees a series of peaks in the EE spectrum for the first time. I'll show you a little more investigation of that in a moment. BB, we set limits. We don't see BB. Uh, these are 95% upper limits. And obviously, we have far more points and they're further down the plot than previous experiments. Unfortunately, the, uh, the lensing BB is down here. 
And it's an order of magnitude lower even than we've gone to. Uh, okay, so does the EE spectrum have peaks? So I played a toy game. You take the lambda CDM curve in red, you smooth it to get the green curve, and you ask what is the chi-squared of that, right? Have we shown that there are peaks? Well, the chi-squared of that has a probability to exceed of one in a thousand. Okay, so it's the quad EE spectrum is inconsistent with a smooth spectrum. That you have to have peaks to fit it. All right, so uh, this is a very crude uh, uh, way to fit those peaks. So I take that smooth curve and then I re-inject uh, uh, peaks and troughs onto it uh, using a simple recipe where the amplitude, the phasing, and the spacing of the peaks is allowed to be free. So three free parameters. And then I refit the blue data. So re the red is the, is the, the basic lambda CDM model uh, from WMAP. And then the magenta is the refitted pra parametric model with these three, three parameters. And you can see it reverts back to lambda CDM very happily. Uh, this is showing peak number versus uh, location. Uh, the positions in lambda CDM of the peaks and where our, our, this three parameter fit wants to put the peaks. So you can see we're very consistent with lambda CDM. Uh, so uh, another thing you can do for fun, after you go into Q and U and you go to E and B in Fourier space, you can go back to map space and make E and B maps. And uh, these are just for fun, right? They're not part of the analysis. But here, are, here is the signal E map and the signal B map. You can see there's loads more structure in E than B. And when you do the same thing with jackknife uh, data, you just see noise, right? So our B mode map is consistent with noise because it looks like a jackknife map. <laughs> this is Weiner filtered, yeah, in some rather simple way. Uh, okay, so Quad has also made observations of the galactic plane that I'm not going to talk about. I just want to point out that they exist. This is a. Uh, uh, early actually. Tom's gone a lot further with this now and it's, it's got really nice maps and pulling out lots of polarized sources out of the galaxy. So con con conclusions from Quad. So a ground-based CMB polarimeter can have excellent stability. Uh, this direct pair differencing worked. Some people said that it would not. It could not. We did not need to modulate. We didn't have any form of active polarization modulating modulation in this experiment. We didn't have a cross-linked map. Again, people said that it couldn't work, but uh, We've shown that it can. A simple Fourier-based analysis is, uh, is adequate for this level of sensitivity. Uh, by far the biggest problems we had, detector weirdness, uh, side load pickup. The thing that we struggled with for many months was uh, the fact that the, the moon can contaminate the data when it's more than 100 degrees away from the viewing direction of the telescope. So although the sun goes down, the moon still continues to come up and down on a, on a monthly time scale. And when it's 100 degrees from the viewing direction of the telescope, there's a, there's a side lobe, and it gets picked up into the data. Now, some days you can see it very obviously, and we just throw those days out. But some of the days, uh, some of the shoulder days, as it were, when it's either side of, of, of being obviously visible, were also contaminated. And until we really understood the mechanism and the, where the side lobe lay, we didn't know which extra days to throw out. That was the biggest struggle that we had in the whole analysis. So uh, Quad was decommissioned a year ago. Uh, this results that I've been showing you are from this paper that came out in May, end of May. Uh, we can prove considerably over previous experiments at L greater than 200. We're consistent with Lambda CDM. We do not see B modes yet, I'm afraid. And uh, the polarization signal cancels under frequency jackknife, so we, we have no evidence for foregrounds the, to the current level of sensitivity. So this is a little teaser. So we can, we can, by waiting in the Fourier plane, do better at high L in TT. And so this is, this is the TT spectrum from 1,000 to 3,000, uh, the lambda CDM input to the simulations, and the output of one realization of a simulation. Uh, we're working on this right now. So this just gives you an idea of the sensitivity that Quad will have. The aqua points for comparison are shown in magenta here. Aqua has these two points, one here and one here at the highest Ls. So you can see Quad at 150 gigahertz has... Uh, comparable or smaller error bars out here and many more points, right? So we have much more sensitivity at the highest L's because we took all of this sensitivity and focused it on such a small patch of sky. We will also have a result at 100 gigahertz, although you can see it's much less sensitive. Now we're working on that right now and uh, we're hoping to have a result out in a matter of weeks. We have to because there are other far better experiments coming soon like SPT and ACK that will blow this away. But uh, we will have something to say about high LTT soon at these two frequencies. 
So I'm going to take a couple of minutes uh, at the end here to tell you about uh, uh, what I am doing, what we are doing next. So uh, Quad is over. Uh, so I'm involved with a new collaboration, which already exists, BICEP, BICEP 1, and which is going forward as BICEP 2, uh, and an extension beyond BICEP 2 called CAC, because the CAC Foundation very nicely gave us money for three more receivers. And it's targeting gravity wave B mods, right? So possibly there are these gravity wave B mods from inflation. Here they're shown versus multipole. They peak at about 100. And this R value uh, characterizes what contribution to the total fluctuation those B mods are, and uh, the tensor to scalar ratio. And so we already know that, 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 that the contribution is probably less than R of 0.3. Uh, I think the current limit's like 0.2, or maybe even 0.15. Uh, if we claim that with this experiment I'm going to tell you about, within a few years, we'll be down to 0.02 in terms of our experimental sensitivity. Now, once you get down there, we will eventually for sure hit galactic foregrounds, right? Even picking the cleanest possible patch of sky. And we think that that will occur in these very clean patches of sky at R of about 0.02. Going lower than that, anyway, one would run into a lensing B, the lensing B mods as a foreground. And cleaning those out is extraordinarily challenging, is almost science fiction from a practical experimental point of view. Uh, maybe it will be done, but hopefully we'll discover BMOs before that becomes an issue, right? Certainly from my point of view, uh, I hope that happens. I'm not, I'm not sure that I want to... I'm not sure that experimentally I, I can be bothered to go much beyond 0.02, right? And people argue that, that, that the BMOs really should be there before we get there anyway. So what is BICEP? BICEP is quad sister ex experiment. It's essentially the quad receiver without the primary and secondary mirror out front. Here it is. It's a very little thing. The receiver is in this, in this structure here. This is a baffle to block radiation from the ground. This is the mighty SPT telescope in the background here, this 10-meter monster that's recently been built at South Pole. So by contrast, BICEP is tiny, right? Now, because it's tiny, it has a very large beam size. So the beam size is 0.9 degrees, 0.6 degrees at 100 and 150 gigs. Uh, by taking the hit, by sacrificing angular resolution, the telescope becomes very small. We can baffle it extremely well. We can get superb, superbly low side lobe response. BICEP, as far as I know, is the first experiment at South Pole that's been able to observe right through the summer season. Right? So instead of being limited to winter now, it can operate all year round because it's sufficiently immune to bright objects that are far away from the line of sight. So uh, BICEP has some very nice maps. These have been for around for a while. This is 100 gigahertz and 150 gigahertz total intensity maps and E and B maps, analogous to the quad ones that I just showed you. Jackknife versions thereof show nothing. So we're seeing E and no B in these maps. Uh, these are uh, simulated, uh, uh, simulated signal maps. So the blue points here are simulated, and real deck jackknife points. Okay, So you can see that the, j the jackknives certainly have excellent cancellation. Whether they're exactly consistent with zero, you can't really see here because the error bars are so small. But uh, 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 bicep, analysis is, bicep 1 analysis is in a very advanced state. These two people at Caltech have been driving it. And uh, look for a result from bicep 1 soon. Okay? Unfortunately, they've both taken other jobs. So I, I don't know how soon, but real soon. It's got to be real soon. Uh, Meanwhile, BICEP2 is under construction. So here is BICEP2. This is the focal plane of it. So we're shifting. It's a complete technology shift from these uh, discreetly fabricated and, and uh, integrated uh, bolometers that were used in quad and BICEP to uh, monolithic arrays of bolometers fabricated on, on a whole, uh, one piece on a silicon wafer. And uh, this is just just simply to push up the number of pixels beyond the, the 50 that the bicep has, you really have to go to a monolithic array. And so there will be 256 dual polarization pixels in bicep 2. It's currently under construction. It's going to deploy a year from now. It was supposed to go this year. It's been delayed by a year. It will go a year from now. <coughs> and I think it will be very ready at that time. So, uh, but still, 256 is, sorry? Four wavelengths between them. The four, the four that made out of no, the so so another thing that we're doing in the bicep uh, uh, line of attack on this problem is uh, to keep each receiver single frequency because then you can optimize all of the optics for that single frequency and get better systematic performance. Right? This is our 
our philosophy, right? Other people are going with multi-frequencies in the same focal plane. All of our focal planes will be single frequency. And that, combined with the fact that we want to go to an even larger number of pixels, means that the next generation beyond BICEP2 will be a multi-receiver system. So basically we can take three BICEP2 type receivers and place them on the platform that was used for DAISY, then for Quad, and which is currently vacant. Uh, that mount is easily big enough to fit three of these things on. Ultimately, we might fit up to six. And we have money already for the first three from the Keck Foundation. So two years from now, we will deploy three additional BICEP2 style receivers on the DAISY platform. Okay, And that is what the sensitivity projections on the previous slide were based on. So just to conclude, uh, this BICEP2 BICEP Keck Array program, it's really... And it's an aggressive program to get a lot of sensitivity as quickly as possible to find out if there is a B-mode signal to be measured. If there is a B-mode signal to be measured, then very expensive, very sophisticated experiments would become justifiable. Uh, really, uh, uh, we're just looking, is there a signal or not? Not to examine it in fine detail. It's a function of angular scale. Uh, so that being the case, we can go after a very small patch of sky, 2% of the, the very cleanest 2% of the sky, and uh, basically trying to avoid foregrounds as much as possible. Eventually, we will have to use multi-frequency to go beyond uh, R of about 0.03. And this is a Caltech Chicago and others collaboration. Uh, people are currently leaving Caltech, and it's gonna, the collaboration will be more institutions in the future. It already is a bunch of other institutions uh, uh, that are contributing uh, technology of one kind or another. At Chicago, we're working on the cryostat and the mount, and we will work on the analysis uh, when there is data. And so that's what I wanted to tell you. Thank you very much. So to look at the view on Martin and this will be through space. So yes, so with this experiment we're focusing on the L of seventy bump, right? If you want to go uh, down to these lowest multipoles. I think that just experience with WMAP already shows you just how incredibly hard that's going to be because a large fraction of the sky, whether you like it or not, is horribly corrupted by the galaxy. Right? And even with multiple frequencies, it's really, really hard. Uh, Spider, uh, the experiment Bath's working on, is going to try and go after this from a balloon covering a large fraction of maybe half the sky, approaching half the sky. Uh, and there's talk of a future polarization satellite beyond Planck that would do this to death, right, with like nine frequencies and ultimate sensitivity. Uh, you know, I, I think that uh, it will possibly be even harder to do it at the lowest multipoles than it is here, because precisely because, you know, there are patches of sky that have foregrounds that are orders of magnitude less than the aggregate of the best 70% of the sky. <coughs> I think both are valid lines of attack. I think that the, the small sky approach is probably coming sooner, with the exception of Spider. I think that currently, um, one of the primary sources of systematics is various side low effects from the ground, the atmosphere, mm -hmm. other things, the moon. And can that be improved by changing your addition illumination pattern, or are you already at the limit of what Sorry? can be done? Can that be improved by changing your primary addition illumination, or is that... Um, so, so quad is very bad from the point of view of side lobes, right? Because it has this great big primary mirror and a secondary mirror and a thing that supports the secondary mirror. Bicep is sacrificing angular resolution in order to get away from having any mirrors at all. It's just lenses, right? So you have this, uh, uh, you have this four baffle here, which is black. It's absorptive. And then behind this is the cryostat window. And then there are just two lenses inside the cryostat. Bicep has, has proven awesome levels of side lobe rejection. So you can measure it, right? You just put a tower up here with a really bright source on it, and you scan your telescope around in some direction far away. And you can measure the side lobes. And the, uh, I don't have the side lobe plot. I should have it. But it, it, it's excellent, right? We have, I, I, I don't forget if it's 80 or 100 dB or something. It's, it's outrageously good. So that's, that's the upside of having a very small aperture. You can baffle it very, very well. Uh, the downside, obviously, is that you have these big beams, right? So bicep is a single issue machine. It's gravity B modes or bust, right? It can't do anything else. You can't go after the lensing B modes with it. Although we will get their, their falling tail uh, if we can get to the sensitivity we think we can. Yeah, but, we have too much below the lensing line, 
Sorry? If I said two line must be below the lensing. Yes, that's what I was just saying, right? So so at these these higher bands we should pick up lensing B. But it's it's not really what you would like to measure lensing B, right? You'd like to measure it up here where it's strong. Bicep can't do that. But we do have excellent side lobe rejection. And hopefully it'll be enough. Yeah. Um, I don't want to put in one historical note. So we actually did a very similar um, peak analysis with CBI. I know you did. And, uh, I stole it. You don't want to expect to say a high curiosity case, but there's, there's strongly very yeah, the, the, okay. One of the, so, one of the things that we did do was directly from the central directly from the maps as opposed to um, in the bits. So the of these three parameters, the CBI analysis only allows two of them free. I can't remember whether it's amplitude and phase so or amplitude let, and spacing. Let the spacing okay. So and I think if you, if I make that restriction, then, you know, the, these error bars tighten up a lot. Yeah. yeah. We, we had an error bar like, I think it's actually 30 or so with the uh, we have these Yes. So. I believe you. I didn't claim this was unique. I just claimed that we did it, and here's the result. But I, I think that look the the degree the degree the number of peaks that you can see here, right? This is it's beyond uh, it's beyond doubt that, that these peaks are really there, and they really do have the phasing and the spacing that lambda CDM says they should, and it's. In a way, it's inevitable, right, if lambda CDM is anywhere near right. But it's also cool because the, the reason these peaks are in antiphase is precisely because of the, uh, you know, the motions of the material. So the temperature spectrum shows you the temperature of the material, and the polarization shows you very directly how it's moving. So it really is moving exactly like it should be for what that's worth. Looking at the number of modes you have, it seems to me you might, might be able to see lensing if you had a optical template that you could predict the B mode of the lensing perfectly, in which case you get a signal noise of, I guess, maybe five on your B mode in cross correlation to a template. But what template to use? Well, you use an optical survey and you predict how much of the E, I mean, the B comes from the leakage from the spill of E due to lensing effects. If you can. Well, you, you make one, I mean, just make a survey. That's why you, you don't need you don't need, you don't need the very, very broad, you don't need any much information. You just need a median Z of two in you know, an optical survey, and that's pretty cheap. Just if you all you want is counts. You don't if you don't actually want photo mm -hmm. just total surface counts up to with a median Z of you know, one or two. Then uh, using color using just very simple color cuts, then you might be able to, you know, at, at these L's, take your E map, convolve it through the predicted deflections and snap the B against what you predict. Well, I take your point that it becomes a one-parameter fit if you know the lensing potential. Uh, but I don't think that that optical data exists or easily could. You also get an extra factor, too, in regards. Well, it's a one-parameter fit, right? So it's only one mode. So yes, I mean, that boosts the signal to noise hugely. If you're looking at, at um, signal squared, whereas you have a number of signal. So the only factor of five is the only factor of five is the signal per pixel against the expected B. It's a factor of 25 when you square it, but pixel by pixel, you only need 100 pixels. To get it's an interesting <laughs> idea. I think that uh, I, I think that the optical data to do it would be very challenging to generate. All right, well, let's, uh, let's thank Tom again and go up to the <laughs>